So, Troy Smith is Associate Professor of History at Tennessee Tech University. Um, he earned his PhD, his history PhD at the University of Illinois in 2011 in the history of race and ethnicity in the United States and in the history of the American South. He wrote a chapter, on, he wrote the chapter on Indian territory in the most recent edition for the Oxford Handbook of American Indian History. And he has a forthcoming book on the history of race in comic books. He also writes fiction in a variety of genres, but is best known for his Westerns. He's a two-time winner of both the Spur and Peacemaker Awards for Western fiction, and has contributed stories to two Lone Ranger anthologies. And I'll say that's where I know Troy from, um, because uh, I was also in those anthologies, and I won't say whose stories are better, but I will say <laughs> that one of us has Spur and Peacemaker Awards and the other doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, I can strongly recommend those anthologies and Troy's writing both fiction and nonfiction in general. So, Troy. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate it. And it is very nice to be able to virtually be here with you all today. And I, uh, I appreciate the invitation. <clears throat> so, um, I also, I, I teach a class on the history of, of comics, which is something that is dear to my heart. Uh, so all these various things that are coming into play with, uh, with Mouse and with some of the recent controversies uh, around it are, are all things that I spend, uh, have spent a lot of time talking about. Um, I may be committing a... Uh, uh, a huge sin for a comic book scholar in that I don't have any images. Um, I, it's just going to be me talking. Um, from what I understand, uh, some of you may have, have read Mouse, and maybe some of you haven't read it yet. So when thinking about this presentation and how to go about it, I was trying to think of a way I could do that um, in, in a a different way than perhaps you could get just by reading the book alone or by, if you haven't read it, uh, Googling it and, and, and reading about it. So uh, what I'm going to do uh, to start off with, and this is, uh, this is something that my family runs and hides when I say, uh, is give some historical context, uh, which is what historians are, are prone to do. I'm gonna give some context uh, that may not seem immediately germane, but I assure you it is. It'll all uh, pull together. Uh, about comic books, graphic novels, uh, about Spiegelman, uh, talk about the book itself some, and then talk about these more recent developments and what it may all mean. Uh, and, and really, that's the, uh, that's the approach that historians take to whatever subject it is that, that they're tackling. And that is to look how things, figure out how things are, are connected together. So uh, first, I'm not sure how many of you here in our audience have read graphic novels before, uh, but I bet some of you have read comic books, uh, which is uh, kind of, oh, we have a, uh, a confessor there at the beginning, uh, the front of the front of the class. Um, there's there's some disagreements uh, about what constitutes a graphic novel. Uh, myself, my my, my personal uh, view is that a graphic novel is something that is uh, kind of self-contained, a single volume that is uh, created to be distributed in that form. Uh, whereas comic books are serial, uh, right? They come out on a regular, uh, usually monthly basis. Uh, and that can get a little bit confusing because Mouse, generally regarded as a graphic novel because it is one big story, actually uh, first came to life 
as uh, a serialized thing it was over a series of years, actually, uh, in in comic books uh, by by Art Spiegelman. So I'm going to uh, to to start off by talking a little bit about not just comic books, but Jewish connections to comic books. That might be something that uh, uh, many of you, even if you've read uh, Superman or Archie or whatever, uh, may not have thought about before, but it very much is, is relevant to this work and to this subject. So comic strips, newspaper comic strips, became a thing in the 1890s and quickly became very popular. And on into the 20th century, they had even achieved, at least uh, comparatively to some things, uh, a measure of respectability. Uh, some people were becoming famous uh, for creating comic strip characters in newspapers. But comic books were not a thing until the mid-1930s, so a good 40-plus years after the comic strip developed. And the way that comic books developed was that, uh, well, there's one person that could probably be called the father of the comic book medium. That was uh, Max Gaines. Maxwell Gaines. This one? Uh, born Max Ginsburg. Uh, he was the son of European Jewish immigrants. And he came, um, he came up with the idea uh, in the mid-30s of taking some of these comic strips and sort of recycling them in magazine form and selling them that way. No one had thought of doing that. Uh, and he was able to convince uh, some financial backers to, to give him the opportunity to, to try that out. Uh, there were a couple of promotional efforts. <clears throat> then, finally, um, a regularly appearing comic book uh, first started coming out, and it was all reprints of uh, newspaper comic strips. Probably the four most important people in the development of comic books as a medium in the 1930s, three of the four uh, were, were Jewish. In fact, all three of them were the sons of European Jewish immigrants <clears throat> who grew up in New York City. Um, by the way, I will say that uh, having heard Art Spiegelman speak, <clears throat> he came to uh, Tennessee Tech a few years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he also spent quite a bit of time providing historical context. So uh, I feel more comfortable doing this knowing that uh, if you had, uh, um, you know, the, the ability to get uh, Spiegelman himself here, this is probably how he would start out. So the, the four most important people in creating uh, the comic books medium who were not writers or artists were, of course, Max Gaines. Uh, there was a guy <clears throat> named, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson. He was a former cavalry officer. He was not Jewish. He was the first person to come up with the idea of a comic book that had all new stories in it uh, that had not been previously uh, appearing in newspapers. And then he was sort of financed and eventually um, bought out by uh, Harry Donenfeld uh, and Jack Leibowitz. Uh, and uh, they're the sort of the grandfathers of what's now DC Comics. So in addition to that, Many of the creators themselves, the writers and the artists in that first, what's called the golden age of comics, which is from their creation in the mid 1930s until the late 1940s. So many of the superhero characters that became popular uh, back during that period uh, have uh, something in common uh, that again, most people probably are not aware of or haven't thought of. So for example, Superman, the very first superhero character came out in Action Comics number one, 1938. Superman was created by two young men named Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. They were both the sons of Jewish European immigrants. Batman was created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Uh, Bob Kane born Robert Kahn, both the sons of European Jewish 
immigrants. Captain America was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby would go on to co-create in the 1960s many of the Mar other Marvel characters like Spider-Man, not Spider-Man, but the Incredible Hulk, uh, um, Avengers, and so forth. Um, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, uh, who was born um, uh, Jacob Kurtzberg, both the sons of European Jewish immigrants. And the list goes on and on. When I first wrote all these down, sort of to make the comparison, I was I was surprised <clears throat> by how large the percentage was of not only specifically Jewish writers and artists, but Jewish New Yorkers who were the sons uh, of immigrants. Um, there were not as many women in the business uh, then, though there were there were some. But uh, most of the uh, people that were uh, sort of uh, driving things, it being the 1930s and 40s, were men. Um, Will Eisner, who created uh, The Spirit and for whom the uh, comic book awards are named. New Yorker, son of uh, <clears throat> Jewish um, European immigrants. Stan Lee, I bet you've all heard of Stan Lee. Um, he got his start in 1939 when he was still in high school uh, his real name was stanley stanley lieber um he fits the, the pattern as well um <clears throat> it's it's interesting to note not just this strange sort of connection but to think about what it means when it comes to not just the business end but the creative end of these works um, let's take Superman as an example. Uh, everybody knows Superman. Now think about it for a moment. Think about the origin of Superman. He was uh, the, uh, the son of a doomed race. His parents put him in this little vehicle and sent him out into the void. Uh, and then he was found and adopted by a completely different race of people and grew up as one of them. But, you know, upon reaching adulthood, uh, learned about his true origin and used his powers uh, to, to help uh, people in general. Now, that's the story of Superman. Does it sound familiar at all outside of a comic book context? I'm talking to a church group here, so somebody ought to... Uh, Moses. Yes, Moses. So Superman, uh, as a character, even though he's not uh, he's not actually even human, uh, let alone Jewish, but he's about as Jewish as a character could get. Uh, and both Superman uh, and various of the other early superheroes in the 30s and uh, before World War II started, um, primarily were defending... Uh, the little guy uh, against corruption and against people who were taking advantage of them, um, sort of um, defending the underdog. And, and I think that in particular, all of these, uh, these Jewish Americans, uh, whose parents, of course, had come from the old world, growing up when they did, you know, there was this, uh, it's called the new immigrants or the new wave of immigrants that started coming in the U.S. in the 1880s uh, that were from Central and Eastern Europe as opposed to Western Europe. Um, and these, uh, these individuals, many of them were Jewish and many of them were um, really treated badly. You know, uh, the 1920s, uh, when many of these guys were coming of age, when they were little kids, was the high point uh, in history of the Ku Klux Klan. And at that time, the Klan was not only opposed to African Americans, they were opposed to immigrants and to Jewish people. Uh, so I think that this, uh, this creation of characters like particularly Superman and Captain America that are sort of hyper-American, is sort of a, a, a way to uh, express that experience of a second generation uh, immigrant uh, who was uh, uh, trying to embrace uh, what was his culture but not his parents culture and also reflecting 
the mistreatment uh, that they themselves had received. Many of these guys had to change their names, just like a lot of uh, other people in the entertainment business had to change their names in the 1930s, uh, or else they might not be able to have an audience. So looking at things in that context, the very birth of the comic book medium makes it to me seem particularly appropriate that one of the most important fictional works, semi-fictional, about the Holocaust appeared as a comic book, uh, written and drawn uh, a generation after these other things I just talked about, but written and drawn by a, uh, a Jewish uh, son of, of immigrants who grew up in, in New York City. It just really just seems to, to fit together there. So Spiegelman himself, um, if you've read Maus, you know a lot about Spiegelman having essentially heard his voice and read his story. Um, got his start in what were called underground comics, uh, which is a, a thing that happened in the late 1960s and into the 70s. Sort of the epicenter of that was San Francisco. It was part of the counterculture movement. So what had happened by that point is that in the mid-50s, there had been some serious censorship of comic books. Um, there had been congressional hearings, actually televised congressional hearings, presided over by Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver, uh to determine whether comic books were causing uh, juvenile delinquency. There was a, uh, uh, a German-born psychiatrist, Frederick Wortham, who worked with children who discovered that uh, all the juvenile delinquents that he worked with read comic books so that must cause it. I mean, he could have also said that they all ride bicycles because they did. Um, but this had resulted in the uh, Comics Code Authority being established, which is a censorship thing. And any comic books that were sold at newsstands from the mid 50s on up until, in some cases, the early 2000s had to have this little stamp uh, with A for approved by the Comics Code Authority. And there were all kinds of things you were not allowed to do anymore in comic books, from uh, portraying the supernatural to portraying things that were violent, uh, to things that were not expressly, explicitly banned, but were implicitly banned, like discussing race, for example. Uh, and in, in the late 60s, several writers and artists um, started producing their own comic books, uh, getting them printed any way that they could. These were small circulation, small scale things that did not have that stamp of approval. That's why they're called underground. Um, started in San Francisco, there was also a big underground comics movement in New York City, uh, particularly in Greenwich Village. So these, these comic books, these underground comics, um, not having to have to pass any kind of censorship boards, being sold on street corners uh, by sometimes the, the, the writers and artists themselves, sometimes being distributed to what were called head shops, uh, where you could get your, you know, uh, marijuana paraphernalia, um, were not the wholesome Archie type stuff. Uh, that got through the censorship board. So they had some really, really uh, taboo subject matter. Uh, and uh, that's where Spiegelman uh, first started to, to make an impact. Now, some of the other um, artists associated with this, probably the most famous one was Robert Crumb. Uh, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, Trina Robbins. Uh, Gilbert... Uh, uh, Gilbert Shelton and others, uh, but but Spiegelman was creating various different uh, stories that were appearing in these underground comics. He, he moved out to San Francisco himself. He had actually gotten a job uh, right out of art school 
in the late 60s with the Topps Trading Card Company to uh, draw and design all of their sort of comedy-oriented uh, trading cards that were usually parodies uh, of regular sports cards. So he had that, that income that was, that was steady. But he moved out to San Francisco and he started uh, doing these underground comics. And somewhere around 72 or so, he did this little short, I think it was three page uh, thing about uh, mice in a concentration camp uh, based on uh, stories that his father had, had told him. Uh, the bottom kind of fell out of the underground comics scene in the mid 1970s, but Spiegelman uh, kept his kept his hand in the business, uh, and he actually uh, founded, published, and edited uh, an independent comic called Raw that had a lot of the sensibilities of underground comics. So let me just stop for a second and talk about why I spent so much time discussing underground comics, especially in con con connection with Spiegelman. Uh, so you've got this Jewish connection to comic books in general. And with Spiegelman being involved in this movement, this underground comics movement, it was totally, completely, 100% opposed to censorship uh, and being restrained in subject matter uh, by anybody. And he continued along that vein uh, into the uh, uh, 80s with his, this uh, comics magazine, Raw. And that's where, that's where Mouse was actually originally published. There was that little three-page thing in the early 70s that was kind of a, uh, just an initial kind of forebear to it. Uh, but he set about trying to actually tell his parents' story and his own story in serialized comic form from 1978 uh, to I think about 1989. Uh, everything that you, uh, that you read there in the collected bound volume of Mouse that is categorized usually as a graphic novel came out a few pages at a time, month by month, over that 12-year period. Uh, in 1986, he was able to get... Uh, what he had done so far on, on the story released in a single bound volume uh, that did really well and drew a lot of attention to his work. Then when he finally finished the whole thing, uh, a second volume was, was released. Uh, so today you can buy them either as part one and part two, or you can get both of them together. Uh, and that's when, that's when he was awarded a special Pulitzer Prize which was the first time, and as far as I know, the only time so far, that a comic book writer and artist won a Pulitzer Prize. There was actually some pushback against it from uh, people who worked in other forms of, of literature uh, because comic books had always uh, been considered sort of low class, kind of trashy. Even back in the 30s, you know, when you could uh, you could work for a comic on a comic strip for a newspaper, if you got syndicated, you could become famous. You could even get rich, and people would respect you. But if you had to work in these little comic books, then you were obviously a hack uh, who uh, who couldn't make it in the real cartoonist world. Uh, and there was some of that directed towards Spiegelman when he when he won that uh, that Pulitzer Prize. But of course. That really got him and this particular work on the map. So that's been almost uh, 30 years ago. And in all that time, uh, Mouse has come to be considered not just one of the, the best and most important graphic novels or, or comic books, but it shows up on some lists of uh, the best literature of the 20th century. Uh, and as such, it has been used a lot uh, for educational purposes. Uh, it has been used a lot in uh, schools and, and so forth. And so that is going to eventually lead us to our most recent uh, 
situation here in the year 2022. But before, before I talk about that, I want to talk about the work itself a little bit. Um, and again, I'm doing this uh, cognizant of the fact that some of you've read it, some of you haven't. Uh, if you haven't, maybe this will make you want to read it more. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into deep, deep detail about the work itself. Uh, but I will say that in my comics history class, which I've taught five or six uh, times, five or six times in a row now, I always assign this book as one of the texts that students are required to read to get uh, a basic beginning knowledge, not just of sequential art, which is the current uh, kind of fancy way to talk about it, um, but of what the, uh, the potential is for that type of art. Because this is a really complex work. It is a really complex, very deep, very powerful, uh, which, you, you know, just knowing of the subject matter, it's about the Holocaust, you would assume uh, that uh, it would be very stark. But in reality, there are so many layers to this book. If you haven't read it, it's not just the story of Spiegelman's parents during the, the Holocaust in the concentration camp. Um, for one thing, it's uh, his parents' story, period, starting with when they met. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it doesn't jump right into the concentration, concentration camp stuff. It talks about their, their early, their, their marriage, their early life, his service in uh, World War I. Uh, and then the gradual changes that are taking place in Europe in the 1920s and into the 1930s with the, uh, the rise of the Nazi regime and the increase in anti-Semitism around Europe that comes with it. Then you've got the uh, concentration camp experience and then their life afterward. Uh, so this is... It's called a survivor's tale. Um, they did survive the concentration camp, uh, but they were they were deeply affected by it. In many ways, each of his parents was was broken in some way. His mother uh, wound up committing suicide uh, later in in life, um, and his father who is sort of the central uh, character in the whole story, um, he has a lot of issues uh, and he's hard to live with. So it's not just the story of his parents. It's kind of, it gets kind of postmodern and a little bit meta because it's Spiegelman's story of Spiegelman learning the story and then telling the story of his parents. So it's his own story as well. So as someone who had not experienced the Holocaust, he was born in 1948, uh, he still suffered from what uh, uh, today is referred to as generational trauma. You know, he wasn't there, but his parents were there, and it was a huge, huge part of their lives, and the effects it had on them were carried through to him by growing up with them. And that means not only the stories of what happened, but their behaviors. Uh, and so he himself has some, uh, some serious uh, emotional issues that he has to work through and deal with. And part of the story of Maus is that, it's of him with his therapist. Um, and beyond, beyond all that, uh, there's also the, uh, just the choices that Spiegelman made in how to tell his parents' story in his own story, in, in the form that he did. So his artwork, for one thing, my, my students, uh, this last time around, I was proud of them. They, uh, they had to write papers about this book, and several of them picked up on this point without having been told. There's not a lot of shading. Oh, dear. There's not a lot of shading. Um, it's almost each one, even though it was a drawn, uh, he did his original artwork. Is everybody, can, did I get frozen? No, you're not you're frozen. On Zoom. Okay, good, good. 
Sorry about that. Uh, I'm used to. Can you hear uh, us? Oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Good. Okay. Okay. We lost you for right. minutes. Here. Uh, okay. Sorry. I, I got a little freaked out for a second. I've been used to uh, doing so many Zoom calls, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, that that happens. So I get a little paranoid. Okay. Anyway. Uh, wait. We're gonna um, pause for a moment just so we can switch over as well. So. Okay. All right. Give me a holler. Okay. Yes. We're just getting to the good part. Yeah. While, we're, while, we're, while we're doing that, can I just ask you a quick, this probably isn't a quick question, but one of the things I noticed about the character of the father is that in the scenes that take place in the 1930s and 40s, um, he really, he's a heroic character. He is, he is kind, he is resourceful. He is supportive of everyone else is going through the same situation. He is brave. And that's not him in the modern era. And I wonder if. Uh, I yeah, so the things that he did to survive, hmm. be the survivor to tell the tale, um, changed who he was. Uh, to a large degree, I think that's a, that's a good observation. That's a good observation. Um, back to the point about the uh, about the art. Um, even though he he did the artwork for this intentionally to try to make it rough by just using a ballpoint pen on regular stationery and then photographing it, each panel kind of looks like a woodcut. Uh, and there's the contrast between the, the line work and the, the open spaces without a lot of shading. Um, it makes it very stark. And then there's this choice to use animals, right? So uh, all the Jewish characters are mice and the, the Nazis, the Germans are cats. And uh, the Poles presented as, as pigs and uh, Americans are like big friendly puppies. Um, that serves a couple of different purposes. For one thing, by taking it away from the human form and anthropomorphizing it like it was like a, a Disney cartoon, if you didn't pay attention to what was actually happening, that sort of adds a layer in one way that insulates the reader from being too horrified by seeing these things happen to people. But in another way, I think that we have the tendency because it's so overwhelming to just blank out what we're seeing happening to people. And then when you have these cute cartoon animals and then you see these terrible things happen to you, that in a way almost makes it more real. Um, his own uh, explanation was that um, he used different animals to represent different, uh, different ethnicities and races to show how stupid it is to distinguish people by ethnicity and race, because it's 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 very it's very fake, you know. Everybody's not a dog or or a cat. Even the dogs and cats kind of look alike. Um, and it's there 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 are some times when it's uh, uh, presents some some difficulties to keep the thing going, like. Uh, he, as the author, is talking about in the book when his French girlfriend, and he uh, presented French as frogs, when his French girlfriend converts to Judaism, does he draw her as a frog or a mouse? Uh, well, uh, the, the overall point is that humans are humans, and these artificial separations just don't work. Uh, and he's demonstrating, A, how silly it is, and B, how dangerous it is, right? Because if you take a whole group of people and you view them as all being the same, then that sort of opens you up and, and your group to treating them as if they were all the same, to treating them as if they were not human. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of thought that went into that decision, and I think that it really shows through in the execution of it. Um, let's see. Well, now I will talk a little bit about more recent issues pertaining to this book. As many of you know, because it was all over the news, 
here in my own home state of Tennessee, which is in the news a lot the last few years, and never for anything good, it seems. Unless it pertains to Dolly, unless it pertains to Dolly Parton, then it's something good. Um, but in McMinn County, uh, county seat is Athens. I'm in Sparta, they're Athens, so we don't get along. Um, it's about 80 miles southeast of where I live. The Board of Education um, ordered the removal of Maus from the eighth grade English curriculum at the McMinn County Middle School. Uh, and this does constitute a ban of sorts. Some people have gotten into semantics and said, you know, as long as it's still in the school library, it's not banned, but it's forbidden to be used in class. So it's banned. This despite the fact that Maus was on the approved list of books to use in a middle school curriculum by the uh, Tennessee Department of Education. But apparently some parents had complained about the subject matter. And you can actually find the minutes of the meeting online. Um, it seemed as though most of the people on the school board were completely unfamiliar with this work. Um, didn't seem as though any of them had, had read it. The teachers that they were talking to were all in favor of using it. Um, but the sticking point uh, was that there were a couple of images in there of naked female mice. <laughs> and and uh, in one of the scenes where the author uh, is arguing with his, uh, his, his father, he says a swear word, um, a swear word that um, Clark Gable used in 1939. <laughs> and so, therefore, they said it is obscene and must be, uh, you know, uh, one of the board members was like, why are we even promoting stuff like this to our kids? And then a couple of them made comments about the violence. Uh, but it seemed that the real thing was that there were a couple of a uh, couple of naked lady mice, and one one word use of of the D word, and that made it seem to a lot of people around the country as if this were sort of disingenuous, because there's a lot of of books that are assigned in eighth grade that might have much worse than that in it. But those are not the ones that were singled out. Uh, in fact, when you're in the eighth grade, you're usually 13 or 14. The things that they referred to as the reasons for banning the book are things that if they showed up in a movie would make it PG-13. <laughs> so it leads you to wonder if there was something else going on with the parents who were complaining or with the school board beyond what they were saying whether it was not the, the difficulty of the subject matter, but sort of the subject matter itself. And this brings us to uh, uh, the necessity, I think, to, to speak bluntly and plainly. There has been a huge rise in anti-Semitism in the United States and in Europe as well in recent years, and particularly uh, in, in, in Tennessee, um, just, a week, just a week before Mouse was banned in Athens, um, there was another thing uh, uh, that got us on the national news. The, uh, the governor had uh, passed this, uh, uh, this act or had, uh, announced this act saying that um, he calls it a Religious Freedom Act that enabled orphanages or adoption agencies who got funding from the state of Tennessee um, to be able to express their religion in doing so. And I think that, you know, the, the purpose of that uh, had to do with LGBTQ issues. Um, but 
what actually happened was that the week before Mouse was banned, one of those adoption agencies uh, denied a married couple, man and wife, from adopting a child because they were Jewish. Uh, and this was a Christian-oriented adoption agency. Also in, in Tennessee, uh, like in a lot of states, uh, about a year ago, there was a, a wave of anti-critical race theory laws being passed in red states around the country. I forget how many have them now. Uh, that uh, prevents public school teachers from talking about anything that might make uh, a student feel guilt, shame, or mental discomfort uh, from anything, and the, the, the wording uh, the wording in these bills, are, these laws, is similar uh, in various states. But anything uh, that could be construed as, and this is the, the word they use, racial scapegoating. Um, anything that refers to uh, privilege or structural racism or various other things, um, it all comes down to uh, a term uh, that's illegal for me to say now in Tennessee, I guess, uh, white fragility. Um, but that's Those also just a part of in California. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They, they, they just passed another law that applies all this to higher education as well in Tennessee. Uh, so we'll see how that works. Um, but I think there's more to it even than that. Uh, this rise in not just anti-Semitism, uh, but in uh, hate speech directed toward multiple minority groups in the last few years. So I, I looked up some, some numbers. <clears throat> in uh, New York City, between the year 2015 and the year 2020, anti-Semitic hate crimes doubled. From 2020 to 21, they doubled again. In the first uh, three months, as of April 1st, first three months of 2022, they're on pace to quadruple what they were last year. Last year on April 1st, there had been 20 uh, this year in New York City, there have been like 84, something like that. Um, there are more news items of uh, uh, Jewish people being attacked on the streets, of uh, vandalism, swastikas and anti-Semitic slogans being spray painted on synagogues, um, mass shootings, at a couple of a uh, couple of synagogues. Um, I think that that goes hand in hand with the fact that a recent study shows that Americans' knowledge about the Holocaust, that is the cause of it and the extent of it and any details of it, is woefully inadequate. Um, this, this study that was uh, made in 2020 uh, of people under the age of 40 at that time, found that uh, when asked how many people died, how many Jews died in the Holocaust, and they were given like multiple choice, 62% um, of them did not think it was as high as 6 million, which is what it was. Um, about half of them thought it was 2 million or less. 48% of them could not name one concentration camp. And 11% of them thought it was the Jews' fault. In the United States, only 22 states out of 50 require teaching about the Holocaust in public schools. So for, for, for years, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was born in 1968. And I was growing up in the 70s. I actually had relatives by marriage who were concentration camp survivors or, or refugees. Uh, I'm not Jewish, but my, uh, my aunt married a, a Jewish man who was a huge influence on me as a kid. So I, I met actual people with numbers on their arms. But also there were things, you know, like uh, the miniseries Holocaust <clears throat> that came out in, I think, 78. 
uh, the winds of war in the 80s, uh, there was a lot of stuff being being talked about. And whenever whenever it came up, uh, people would say we're doing this because it's so important. People never forget. In fact, um, General Eisenhower, later President Eisenhower, when the concentration camps were liberated, uh, immediately came to one himself to, to look around and see for himself what had happened. And he said he was doing that so that he could serve as an eyewitness against those in the future who would undoubtedly claim that the whole thing was propaganda. So you've got, on the one hand, this disconnect with the history. Um, this is what makes history so important. So you lose that history and then you're more prone to make the mistakes of the past or commit the sins of the past. And at the same time, you've got this rising uh, sense <clears throat> in the United States and in Europe as well uh, of sort of a, a sense of uh, blaming Jews for things uh, and other minority groups for things and then uh, using that as justification for, for violence. Um, that is... Uh, well, it was really, to me, it was it was chilling when that thing happened in Charlottesville. And uh, I guess that was 2017, I think. Uh, but you're familiar with, you know, when the, uh, the 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 Proud Boys and all these white nationalist groups were gathered together to protest the removal of Confederate statues. Uh, and uh, the one uh, young lady, the counter protester, was was murdered uh, by being run over along with several other people by by a car. And these guys, these these white nationalists, they were marching, you know, with their polo shirts and their tiki torches, uh, and they were chanting, "Blood and soil," which was one of the mottos of the Nazi party in Germany. And they were chanting, Jews will not replace us, which ties into a uh, conspiracy theory on the radical, radical uh, far right that um, um, the increase in immigration is all orchestrated by the Jews uh, to dilute uh, Americanness and more easily control everything. And it's, it, was, it was chilling to hear people saying that and believing it in such large numbers in the 21st century. So kind of a little uh, side, side note here. Um, I've been watching the, uh, the Disney Plus Moon Knight series as a big comic book fan, and it made me want to go back and reread uh, the original run of that series, which had started in 1980. And just yesterday, I reread issue 15 from January 1982, 40 years ago. And the plot revolved around this very radical far-right cop. He was the villain um, who had a secret shrine to Hitler at his house and who believed that uh, immigration uh, was, was uh, just this, this plot to weaken America and so he was going around killing immigrants. And it was presented in such a way as like, you know, there's some really crazy people out there. Uh, but then reading it, there's still some really crazy people out there, but they're out in the open. And it seems like there's a lot more of them 40 years later, right? Um, and all of these, these efforts to suppress the teaching of history. Um, they're, they're, they're dangerous. Uh, of course, this, this work is a wonderful, uh, wonderful work to especially get, um, you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds uh, to engage with the realities of the Holocaust. Um, 
the, 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 the effects are like, for example, maybe you heard about this in the news uh, after some of these critical race theory laws were passed in Texas, high school principal told the teacher uh, who had books about the Holocaust in her classroom, you have to have an equal number of books telling the other side. What's the other side of the Holocaust? <laughs> And this, this, very, this very law I was talking about that just passed in Tennessee when the state legislature was, was uh, talking about it, one of them said, you know, it's perfectly fine to teach about slavery or the Trail of Tears as long as you do it in a balanced way. What the heck is the balance, right? Um, that's something to think about. Now, I want to close. Um, because I'm coming up on the uh, 1130 mark. I got a few more minutes. I want to close by talking about fascism, which is totally appropriate uh, when discussing mouse, because it is one person's retelling of his own parents' retelling of living in a time and in a place where fascism slowly grew and what the results were. Um, a lot of people don't know what fascism means. Uh, it has become sort of uh, like a synonym for meanie, right? Uh, who's a fascist? Anybody that's mean. But that's not what it means, you know. Um, it is a specific ideology. It is an authoritarian ideology. Uh, but more than that, well, the word itself comes from the fascist party of Italy in the 1920s. They got their name from the fasce, which was an object used in the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire. Um, maybe you've seen pictures of it. It's like a, a bunch of little rods, all uniform, that are put together in a bundle and tied up, and there's a little axe head on the top. Uh, that was a sign of authority of Roman leaders. And it shows up uh, actually in some uh, early... Uh, seals and, and, and other official artwork of uh, the U.S. government um, because the, the basic concept behind it is unity. But the reason that fascists latched onto this is the idea is if you've got these little slender rods, each individual one can easily be broken. But if you put them together in a big bundle, they can't be broken. You put an ax head on the end and they can become an offensive weapon that is unstoppable. But if you think about that basic meaning, which, you know, kind of makes sense when you're talking about the, you know, 13 states coming together to form a new country. But if you think about that enough in context of the fascists of Italy and the Nazis of Germany and, and elsewhere, um, in order for that bundle to work, the rods have to be uniform. For it to fit together, they have to all be the same size. They have to be the same width. You can't have some that are shorter than others or longer than others, because if you do, you bundle them together, they are not as powerful. They can fall apart more easily. So fascism is the idea of everybody conforming and being the same type of person. Anything that doesn't fit in weakens the state and that's exactly what you know what hitler was doing uh was making sure that all the odds and end pieces if if you you will were discarded and destroyed so it's a form of hyper nationalism and really one of the best ways to promote something like that is to reframe history reframe and retell history so that people don't know what actually happened and what the actual consequences are of things like that. And that is what brings us to, around to the extraordinary importance of this book and the fact that this book is the one being singled out. By the way, after that incident in January, um, Tennessee's governor, uh, issued another order and uh, the Senate is uh, working on passing another bill um, 
to remove all obscene materials from public school libraries and classrooms. Obscene being defined by if anyone complains about it hmm. or anything that someone might complain about. When they were debating the critical race theory bill, one, uh, one senator, a uh, Democrat from Nashville, pointed out that when it passed last year pertaining to the public school classrooms, the first things that were complained about were books about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. So I feel like we are in a dangerous time as a nation. Now, I'm saying this as a historian. Uh, you've heard the expression, you know, that the, those who do not know history are doomed uh, to repeat it. Uh, I've learned that those who do know history are doomed to stand helplessly by screaming at everybody while they repeat it. Um, <laughs> it is really, really an important uh, topic, and I'm glad, I'm glad that y'all were wanting uh, to talk about not just the work itself, which in itself is just very important, but the broader context. So I will uh, make that my official closing. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm going to have to get upstairs to uh, prepare for worship. Uh, Jim Duffy can handle the is here to handle the question and answer session. Jim, sure. is that okay? Sure. Um, and Matthew, well, th thank you. Um, just I want to say something about our agenda the next two Sundays. Next Sunday, being Easter, we have some nice service that conflicts with ADG. So there's no ADG next Sunday. It never has been on Sunday before Easter. And then the following Sunday, you were giving a presentation, Matthew, about... Yeah, you already published it. Again. Yes. Yeah, the Gospels that didn't make the cut. Exactly. <laughs> so, I want to save it for you, left, in case you want to say anything about it. Um, it's a presentation. There, there are a lot of Gospels. Uh, four of them, I hope you've all heard of. Uh, <laughs> there are quite a few others, and, we'll, and, and, and they didn't... You know, you, you see things every once in a while on the, on the line that say this was banned from the Bible. This was removed from the Bible. Actually, no, they, they were never in the Bible. They were they were they were used by groups of worshiping Christians, um, and they've got names like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, and um, they're very interesting. They tell us a lot about how diverse early Christianity was. And we're going to take a look at some of those and um, and learn a little more about that diversity and, and learn probably why these um, were, were, were not um, included in the Bible when the Bible became a consistent body of uh, consistent canon. And we're also going to look at some of the popular um, ideas that you can find in scholarly books like the Da Vinci Code um, that, that give the story, the conspiracy theory story of why these books aren't in the Bible and and look at how maybe those aren't the actual reasons. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So questions for speaker? Any questions? Christians? So what do you think, Troy, about the current situation of anti-Semitism between Putin and Ukraine? A repeat of history, basically. The modern Hitler is Putin. That is, uh, that is also very scary and something that I have uh, uh, that I have pointed out, perhaps illegally in class, um, that yes, um, there are so many parallels, right? Because H Hitler used as an excuse for his earliest efforts at expansion, the fact there were German speaking people in these neighboring countries. So therefore it ought to belong to Germany. Uh, and that's exactly what Putin was saying uh, about Ukraine. Uh, and then I feel like a 
course, it's a lot different situation because we're in the atomic nuclear, we're in the nuclear age, and that complicates things. That's very dangerous. One push off yes. that button, everything's gone. Okay? Yes. Nobody wins in the war. And when you, I don't care who it is that says, we're going to win the war. They're, they're not thinking. In the war, nobody wins. Right. Everybody right. loses. And then Putin's words coming out of Putin's mouth saying, you know, they're like pure race and the Ukrainians are, you know, kind of <laughs> second class or a contamination to their race, cleanse and quote unquote cleanse. Cleanse of what? Yeah. You don't kill yeah, people not, cleanse. Cleanse yeah. of democracy. Don't give up. Because away. of uh, the nuclear situation, I think, primarily because of that. Uh, Putin has been allowed over the last really 20 years uh, to keep in for you know like the, the the Chechen situation 20 years ago and then he just came in and took Crimea and no one did anything about it because what can you do about it we talk about uh, history nuclear war. yeah do we ever learn from history hell no excuse my language <laughs> well the more people are aware of history uh, the better the odds that maybe we can do something uh, about it. But, you know, that's that's the danger when it starts getting papered over uh, or, or whitewashed, as it were. Mm. Yep. Are there any lessons that we could have learned from history on how to stop this anti-Semitism and just the path we seem to be going down? I mean, obviously, they weren't able to stop it for World War II, but can we, how can we work as people to stop it? Um, I didn't hear all of your question, but how did, how to how could we have done something to stop? Are you talking about the situation in Ukraine or something else? No, just in the United States to try to stop this transition and this increase in anti-Semitism. Yes, yes. Um, you know, this is going to seem off topic, but it's not. Uh, back in 2007, there was an incident in Louisiana on a college campus where some white students uh, who had some kind of an argument with a black student had hung a noose mm -hmm. over a tree outside their dorm. And it made huge news, right? Because that was a rare thing in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time thinking and saying, this is a dangerous situation because we are so far removed now from the civil rights movement that people are thinking of it as something in the distant past and not paying attention to it, not paying attention to the underlying issues uh, and to the, the, the problems, the intrinsic problem of race in America. And when you stop paying attention to it, it can sneak back in. Uh, so I think that what we should have learned <clears throat> is the need to keep revisiting history uh, and have a better historical understanding. Uh, here in Tennessee, when I was when I was growing up, you took a year of U.S. history in the eighth grade, and then you took a year of U.S. history again in the eleventh grade. Both of them covering from, you know, pre-colonial to the present, um, which might seem repetitive, but you're a much different person at 16 than you are at 13. And getting, I think that getting that first year in gives you the basic knowledge. And then, you know, you become a junior in high school, you can get a little bit deeper into it. But what they've done in the last, sometime in the last 20 years, is now they take one semester of the first half of U.S. history in the eighth grade, and then one semester of the second half in 11th grade. So for one thing, by the time you get there, you haven't talked about, you know, the principles of the revolution, for example, since you were 13. And then you go on to college. You haven't talked about any of this stuff in 10 years. Um, I think that there has been so much emphasis on immediately 
tangible utilitarian things in education like STEM education to get a better job. That particularly in, in high school and in higher education, this has de-emphasized things like history uh, or um, civics classes, which are not called civics classes anymore, they're called government classes, uh, de-emphasize that to the point that we are producing um, young people who may know how to do certain things, but they don't know why. And they don't know the context, they don't know the dangers. And so then you wind up just going back and, and, and repeating, like, like we talked about earlier, people under 40 have this woeful lack of knowledge. So that's that's the big lesson to learn is don't stop learning the lesson, I think. Where is that coming? Where is the, for the force behind that? Is it coming from school boards or is it coming from the state government? Or? Let's see you speak our, our Jim oh, Or the speaker. Well, I think that uh, the whole thing about the move away from uh, history and, and, and uh, the humanities and toward uh, other things instead. That's, I don't think that's a political thing. I think that Democrats and Republicans uh, for the last quarter century have been doing that. I think it started in the late 90s when there were uh, studies that showed that uh, American high school students were not doing as well on math as Asian high school students like in Japan or China. And so there was this big refiguring to make American students more competitive with uh, math and the physical sciences, um, that there was a de-emphasis on the other stuff that I think gave, I think that uh, for, for a, a long time, uh, gave uh, American kids kind of, kind of an advantage because when you're taught to not just learn a bunch of facts, but when you're taught to think creatively and to be creative and think outside the box, then if whatever field you're studying for goes under and you have to think on your feet and adjust and become something else, you've got the mental wherewithal to do that. Uh, and then you've got the mental wherewithal to be innovative um, as opposed to kind of stifled. I've, as this has happened, I mean, it, it started with uh, George W. Bush, I think, with uh, No Child Left Behind, but then Obama just called it something different uh, and still hasn't changed that much. All the emphasis on standardized testing that uh, takes away from the teacher in the classroom, the ability to focus on what they've been trained uh, to know is important. Um, that I have increasingly, I, it's not just me, my colleagues point out the same thing, that over the course of the last 10 years, we're getting students who spent their entire education in this kind of no child left behind, race to the top, or whatever you call it, testing thing. They're coming into college without much of the basic knowledge that we used to expect college students to have. And a lot of times, um, they don't know how to sort of do things for themselves. You know, I mean, they're, they're used to having, there's, um, you got these standardized tests and the school's funding is, is tied to it. And so if the teachers don't drill you and drill you and drill you on these 20 things, then the teacher's going to get bad marks, not get a raise, the school's going to lose money. And so that's all they do. And they give you the list. And then your job is to be tested on it a bunch of times to do well, to get the money. Uh, you don't know anything that's not on that list. And you don't know how to make your own list. You're listless, as it were. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> come in, and they want me to give them a list on day one of everything that will definitely be on the final exam. They want that and nothing else. You know? Uh, so I, I made a list with like 400 things on it. freaked them out. Uh, and well, said, Troy, well, something's going to be on there. Will this yeah. be on an exam, Troy? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If it's not on the exam, we don't want to hear it. 
Um, so I, I, I think that it has been a very, on the one hand, misguided and misplaced effort to do something good to make our kids more competitive as they become adults. But I have to wonder, too, if there are not special interests involved, the companies that make these tests make a fortune. You know, um, it's certainly in their best interests to test more instead of less. But I could be off. I could be off on that. That could just be my uh, my natural cynicism showing yeah. through. But I think Cam it's has been trying to ask a question for the whole question and answer period, and I don't know if she's still there to ask it, but she's put it in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I guess she gave up. <laughs> well, we're waiting for her to show up. I just have a quick comment to read from you. In, when the Soviets, Russians, really? lost Sputnik in 1958, yeah. the Southern United States went from a feeling that we were tech, not technologically ahead to suddenly realizing we were very far behind. In fact, overemphasizing it. And so in reaction to that fear of Russia, of Soviet Union, um, education really got a big push yeah. in the late 50s and it continued in the 60s. But that's certainly, I, I, I know it very well because engineers get a job so easily in that time frame. Um, yeah. But uh, man, times have changed. You need to, uh, you're correct. And, and I'm certainly not against, you know, engineers or no, various new disciplines. I think there should just be balance. Yes. By the way, if, if, if y'all, um, I'm in Tennessee, so I'm saying y'all, if, if y'all uh, see Pam, uh, tell her that she can get in contact with me uh, through Matthew and ask her question and I'll answer it to her uh, directly. Who's Pam? Who's Pam? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Pam, Pam uh, Monroe. And oh, oh, okay, okay. Oh, Ellen. 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 So, any other questions? Now's your chance. Actually, I, I think it's interesting when I was going through school and I went with a lot of Asian students through schools, my history classes, I realized later, never covered World War II. And I wondered about that, um, but I think it had to do with the sensitivity of the subject and what we Americans did. So we've been blocking out history for a long time, and now I think the issue is people think we're changing history. So the history that we learned just my comment. So Troy, uh, we, we have your address, mailing yes. address. So the check will be in the mail. Um, any, okay. other, any other final comments? If anyone thinks questions? of other questions later, you can contact me and, and I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you all for having <laughs> Will you want to talk about the Scopes trial, which happened in Tennessee? Will you break on that? I beg your pardon. Are you talking to me? Oh, forget it. Forget it. That's talking about the Scopes trial. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're coming up on uh, in three years the centennial of that. Yes. And yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I teach. Uh, I also teach a class uh, about the history of Appalachia, and that figures prominently in the nation's view of of our area. Um, and there too, uh, this is something that's not perhaps as well known, there is some evidence that the whole thing was sort of staged by some of the town fathers to get uh, tourists to come in. And it succeeded, I think, way more than they wanted it to. Uh, case. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Thank you.